The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. We're going to move on with GrowEL, GrowEF, um, and a few more comments about where we closed yesterday and then talk about experiments that were done to determine what polypeptides are folded by this machinery. So I'm just curious, has anyone stuck Trigger Factor or GrowEL into PubMed to see how many hits you get? Yeah, so Rebecca's question yesterday, um, or on Monday, about trigger factor and active versus passive folding motivated me to, to take a look. Um, so just to give you some scope, if you put trigger factor in PubMed as of last night, there's 11,810 hits um, there. Okay, GrowEL is closer to two to 3,000 in that, that range. Um, if you put trigger factor active folding, you end up with 34 hits. Um, most of those are about using trigger factor and protein overexpression. Um, so if you also express trigger factor, does that help? Um, and it looked like there was one paper in those 34 that suggests an active folding role for um, one of the domains. But that is just looking at an abstract. And so um, the point there is there's many, many studies that consider these chaperones and, and a huge literature to search. So what we're able to cover here is really just the tip of the iceberg for that. Um, there's also a new review out on GrowEL, GrowES, which is not required reading, but we're posting it um, on Stellar. So it just came out last month, and I really enjoyed reading this review. I thought they did a very good job of talking about current questions that are unanswered yet in terms of models and presenting different models for how this folding chamber works. So passive versus active, for instance. Um, and they also give a summary of the substrate um, scope. So the experiments we'll talk about today. So where we left off last time, we went over the structure of this um, folding chamber. And here's just another depiction of the overview. So. Um, effectively, we have two back-to-back -back heptamer rings, as shown here. Some polypeptide in its non-native state can bind. It initially binds up at the top by these apical domains, and there's some hydrophobic interactions. Okay, ATP also binds, and we have all seven ATPs bound within one ring, the ring that has the polypeptide. Okay, we see the lid come on. And then this polypeptide has some time, a residency time in this chamber um, to fold. And then after the residency time, which is generally quoted on the order of six to 10 seconds, um, the lid comes off and it gets ejected. And during that time, the ATPs are hydrolyzed. So somehow this ATP hydrolysis um, gives conformational changes that drive this cycle. Okay, and then we see, again, we flip to having function in the other ring. Um, so one point to make involves cooperativity. So I hope you've all seen cooperativity before, probably in the context of hemoglobin. Um, we have examples here of positive cooperativity and negative cooperativity, right? So within one heptamer ring, ATP binds to all seven subunits. So that's positive cooperativity. And then we can think about negative cooperativity between the two rings where we only have ATPs bound to one ring. So the other heptamer ring will not have ATP bound here. So what is happening inside this chamber? Right, the polypeptide enters the chamber and it's given this protected environment to fold. And we saw that when the GROWES lid comes in, that the hydrophilic nature, hydrophobic nature of the interior changes and it becomes more hydrophilic. Um, so I just want to point out, and this also builds upon Rebecca's question from last time, is this passive folding in the chamber, so effectively in Anfinson's cage, where the primary sequence um, dictates the trajectory, or does the actual chamber itself play a role? So that would be active folding. Um, and effectively, is there forced unfolding or refolding um, by GrowEL itself? So 
Perhaps the apical domains can force unfolding before a polypeptide is released into the chamber, and the cartoon that was just up indicated that to some degree. Maybe the cavity walls um, are involved. And what I would say is that the pendulum on this has swayed quite a bit over the years um, in terms of whether or not GROEL is a passive folding cage or actively involved in folding. Um, and some of the debates in the literature um, have resulted from experimental setups that may bias results to indicate one thing or the other, um, and that's something the community is striving to work out these days. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit more on the next slide, but I'll just note these questions are still there, um, and the recent review I just noted discusses these questions. Um, there was a study just a few years ago that was performed with very dilute polypeptide substrate, um, so below one nanomolar. And what they conclude from this study is that GROEL um, is involved in active folding of a maltose binding protein mutant. Um, one question I'll just bring up with this is maltose binding protein is a nice model polypeptide, but, but what happens for a native GROEL substrate? Um, and is there utility in studying those? So why have I emphasized this dilute protein sample um, point here? So what happened in some early work in terms of studies that were done to try to differentiate active or passive folding is that there were some complexities in in vitro studies. So here I just have a cartoon of folding in the chamber. Um, and if we think about only one polypeptide within the GROEL chamber, it's folding in isolation, right? So there's no possibility for it to form an aggregate or a ligamer with other polypeptides, right? It, it's all alone here. So this folding in the chamber avoids the complications of the folding landscape we talked about in the introductory lecture to this module. So what happens in aqueous solution? Right? There's the possibility that depending on your conditions, maybe there's some sort of aggregate that forms. Right? And if this aggregate forms, what does that mean in terms of what you see? And so in earlier work, there were some um, in vitro kinetic studies that indicated GROEL accelerates folding relative to folding in dilute aqueous solution. Um, but some of these comparisons weren't appropriate because as it turns out, um, a oligomerization might compete with what you're watching for, right? And so if there's some oligomerization happening, um, it might indicate that the rate is slower than you think, right? So there's ways to monitor for this, and it's just a point in terms of kind of what control studies do you need to do to make sure your experimental setup is appropriate there. So I think it will be exciting to see what's to come um, in future years about this question and sort of what kinds of biophysical techniques are applied, um, including single molecule studies here. So where we're going to go um, moving on is to think about what actually are the substrates for GROEL. So what polypeptides get folded in this chamber? And how do we begin to address that question um, from the standpoint of what's happening in the cell? OK, so first we're just going to consider some observations, and then we're going to go into the experiments here. So here are some observations. So the first one is that polypeptides up to 60 kilodaltons can fold in this chamber. So that's quite big, 60 kilodaltons. Um, some proteins or polypeptides need to enter the growy L chamber multiple times to be folded. So that means the chaperone has the ability to bind and release and rebind the polypeptide um, here. So when studies are done in vitro, what's found is that almost all polypeptides interact with GROEL. So you just saw even an example of that um, in terms of this non-native maltose binding protein. So many polypeptides will interact. And this really contrasts what's observed in the cell where in vivo, um, GROEL is involved in only folding about 10% of E. coli proteins here. OK, so what observations three and four suggest is that GROEL has some preference for particular endogenous polypeptides. And what we want to answer is, you know, what are these polypeptides and what are their properties here? Okay. <clears throat> 
So Hartle's group did some nice studies um, to look at this, what needs to be done. Um, first of all, there needs to be a way to isolate the polypeptides that are interacting with GROW-EL in the cell. Okay, and then once these polypeptides are isolated, they need to be analyzed um, in order to learn about their identity and properties. Okay, so we're going to look at experiments that were done to address this. Um, and they involve pulse chase labeling of newly synthesized proteins, immunoprecipitation, and analysis here. So um, in terms of addressing what are these substrates, we're going to begin with pulse chase labeling. Here. Okay, so Basically, the goal of this experiment um, and why we're starting here is we want to determine which proteins interact with GROW-EL. And in addition to which proteins, we want to determine how long they interact. So what is the experiment? These experiments are going to be done with live E. coli cells. Okay. So we want to know what's happening in the cell. So imagine we have an E. coli. Okay. And so these bacteria are grown in some culture medium. And the trick here is that they're going to be grown in medium that's depleted in methionine. Okay. So incubate. or grow in medium with no methionine. Okay, so effectively we're depleting them of that amino acid. Okay, so then after some period of growth, what are we going to do? We're going to spike the culture with radio-labeled methionine. Okay, and this is the pulse. So we're going to add 35S methionine. Okay, and we're then going to incubate for 15 seconds. Okay, and so that's the pulse with a radio labeled amino acid. Then what are we going to do? And after we go through the steps, we'll go through why. Okay. <coughs> After this stage, we're going to add excess unlabeled methionine, okay? Here. And we're going to then continue this culture for 10 minutes. Okay, this is the chase here. And during this chase period, basically samples will be taken at varying time points. Okay, and then at some point, we're just gonna stop this. Okay, so let's just say stop culture and experiment. Okay, so what's happening in each of these steps and, and why are we doing this? So what we want to do is think about newly translated polypeptides, okay? So we have a living E. coli, it has ribosomes, and these ribosomes are going to be synthesizing polypeptides over the course of this experiment. So during the pulse period, Okay, all proteins or all polypeptides <coughs> synthesized are radio labeled. 
right? Because the methionine has been depleted from the culture medium, and so effectively the methionine that these organisms are seeing are the S35 labeled methionine, right? And all polypeptides <coughs> have an informal methionine from the initiator tRNA and what other methionines are in this sequence, right? So if we think about doing this for 15 seconds, and we think about the translation rate, right, which I gave as 6 to 20 amino acids per second when we were discussing the ribosome, right, we want to think about how long are these polypeptides going to be, right? So we have a translation rate, bless you, of 6 to 20 amino acids per second. Okay, so if we think about 15 seconds of a pulse, we're getting polypeptides on the order of 90 to 300 amino acids synthesized during that time. Okay. So newly synthesized polypeptides in these 50, 15 seconds are radiolabeled. What happens next? Okay, we have this chase period where we flood the system with unlabeled methionine here. Why are we doing this, right? So certainly there's some polypeptides that are longer than 300 amino acids, right? That still need time to be synthesized. And if there's new polypeptides being synthesized that start in this stage, we won't <coughs> see them because this unlabeled methionine is in vast excess over the radio-labeled methionine that was added early, okay? So here, You know, the synthesis of larger polypeptides. Can be completed. Okay. And we have no longer producing radiolabored new polypeptides. <coughs> okay, so this allows us to only see the peptides that were radiolabeled during this pulse period here. So what are we going to do in terms of the sampling um, at various time points? So let's say we want to sample at one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, what do we need to do? So can we just aliquot out some of these E. coli and put them on our bench? We could, but that's not gonna be very helpful to us, right? Because, <coughs> What we want to do is stop the translation machinery and all of the cellular machinery here, right? So, yeah, yeah we, need, we need a quench. And not only do we, we need a quench, we're dealing with a living organism too, right? So we need to break open the E. coli and whatever this condition is to stop, stop the reaction. Okay, so we're gonna take aliquots at varying time points. Okay, and basically we care about time so that we have to immediately lice or break open the cells. Um, and this was done in the presence of EDTA. So what is EDTA? Yeah, ethylene diamine, right? Triacetic acid. So um, it's a chelator, 
And why might this lysis be done in the presence of this metal chelator? Processes like um, well, chelate magnesium, which would help. Are there proteases that are <laughs> binding? There certainly are zinc proteases. Yeah, so that that's one class of protease, right? So EDTA will chelate many many different metals, right? The main point here is we want to stop stop translation, right? shut down processes here. Okay. So we have these samples. Um, what do we need to do next? Um, we need a way to detect we need to detect these newly synthesized proteins interact with GROW-EO. Okay, and we want to do this at each time point. So how are we going to do this? We have a very complex mixture that has all of the cellular components. Um, So the next step in this will be immunoprecipitation. <coughs> okay. And so what will happen in immunoprecipitation in these experiments is that the researchers had an antibody that binds to grow EL. And this antibody was put on a bead um, and used to fish out GROW-EL from this complex mixture. And we need to talk about these antibodies a little more. But just in starting, imagine there's a bead, right? And we think about antibodies as being Y-shaped um, biomolecules. So here we have a GROW-EL. <laughs> Okay. And imagine that in this mixture, we have GROW-EL that has some polypeptide bound. <coughs> That's one of its endogenous substrates. So if these are mixed together, And the antibody binds GROW-EL with the polypeptide attached. OK, here we can imagine capture of this species here, OK? Um, and using the bead to separate, say, by centrifugation. So, Let's think about this a little bit and a little background to have everyone up to speed. Um, if you need to learn more about antibodies, please see a basic biology textbook for further details. Right? But these are Y-shaped molecules. They're produced by a type of immune cell called B cells. Um, and they're used by the immune system to detect foreign, foreign biomolecules and help to neutralize them. Um, and so in these, the tip of the Y contains a paratope, okay, that ideally binds specifically to a particular epitope, in this case, um, GROW-EL here. And so we often think about a lock and key model with antibody and think about the antibody binding its target with precision um, here. So for these experiments that were done, just realized the researchers had to come up with an antibody to grow EL. How is that done? Um, they may have immunized, say, a rabbit with, or given a rabbit um, <coughs> grow EL and allowed that rabbit to produce antibodies, and then they isolate the antibodies here. 
Um, so something we want you to take home from this course is yes, um, the antibody should bind the target with precision, but there's huge problems um, in terms of use of antibodies in research. This is just the start of an article that was published last year around this time, and it's focused on pharma and clinical trials, but this is much more broad. Um, and often antibodies aren't as specific as indicated by the label on the container from the supplier here. Um, and it's pretty dismal what they quote in this in terms of um, how difficult it is to reproduce data here. So if you're going to use an <coughs> antibody, you always need to test it to see whether it is selective or not for the species of interest that you want to detect there um, and have that information on hand so you don't misinterpret your data here for that. So what are the steps for this immunoprecipitation? Um, basically, as shown on the board, beads will be functionalized with the antibody and they're just <coughs> added to the cell lysate. Um, and the antibody can recognize GROW-EL and the goal and hope is that whatever polypeptides are associated with GROW-EL um, are pulled down together. So that's something a bit incredible here <coughs> that these polypeptides remain bound to grow EL during the steps um, of this process, right? You can imagine if there's a low affinity binder, it could be lost. So the sample can be centrifuged and then you can isolate these beads here. Um, so in cartoon form, a complex cell lysate in your microcentrifuge tube you can add the antibody Okay, centrifuge and see down here, we've pelleted the beads with grow yellow attach. And then some sort of workup needs to be done to dissociate um, the protein or polypeptide substrates here. And then they can be analyzed. How long, how long, do, they, how long do they do that for? Do you know how many? Can how long do they centrifuge for? No, for the immunoprecipitation. Like, 30 minutes? Is I like, don't know how long the yeah. incubation time is. Need to go back to the experimental, but that's getting right back to this question as to how do they stay bound. How do they stay bound? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so see the point here. If you have a high affinity complex, that's one thing, right? If you have low affinity association between grow EL and the polypeptide, you can imagine it might get lost during this workup. And <coughs> How much do we know about those affinities there? Yeah. You said that they would just give um, rabbits GRVL and hopefully antibodies yeah. happen. Um, but if a rabbit, a rabbit's like immune system encountered GRVL, would it actually see it as a an antigen that it had to develop antibodies against? So, yeah. So here, here's the point. Would it? Right. So. If it's E. coli grow EL, would the rabbit recognize this? Yes or no? And if no, then what can you do to provoke an antibody response? And so what can be done is say you could take a grow EL subunit and attach that to something immunogenic. So there are carrier proteins that will mount an immune response. So um, one of the subunits of cholera toxin is an example that can be used. And then the idea is you're mounting an immune response against that carrier protein, but you'll also get antibodies um, to whatever is attached. So that, that's another strategy for doing it if direct injection doesn't work. And two, um, not going off on a, a big tangent, but there's some decisions that need to be made. So would they use the full length grow EL? Or maybe they would just use a polypeptide region, like some shorter polypeptide that's a portion of grow EL. So there's, there's a lot of possibilities there in terms of what you use to generate the antibody <coughs> for that. Um, there. And it's something that a lot of companies do these days. You can send them your protein or your polypeptide um, fragment and they'll conjugate it to one of these carriers. and treat the rabbits or whatever animal and then isolate those antibodies and then they need to be characterized there for that. Okay, so um, how are these samples going to be analyzed? That's the next step. Um, so for the analysis, 
effectively, we're going to have some mixture. And at the onset, we don't really know how complicated this mixture will be, right? I told you initially that about 10% of E. coli polypeptides are thought to be substrates for GROEL, which is quite a large number if we think about the total number of proteins in E. coli, right? And the other point is we have this radio label, which we're going to use for detection there. Okay. So for analysis, Okay, there's two things. We need to separate these various polypeptides in each sample. Okay, and then we need to determine what their identities are here. So, that we're bound to grow EL from one another. Okay, and then we need to determine identities. And once we know the identities, we can think about their properties. Okay, and this needs to be done at every sample that was collected along this time course, right, which is also going to give some temporal information. So what are the methods that have been used? So in order to separate the proteins in this complex sample, um, the method is a 2D gel. So 2D gel electrophoresis. Okay, and in terms of um, determining the identities, what's done once these polypeptides are separated is to do a protease digest. And then mass spectrometry. Here. Okay. Has anyone here ever run a 2D gel? We're seeing the equipment. One person. Has anyone heard of 2D gels? Fair number. OK. So we'll go over this briefly in terms of 2D gel. In terms of 2D gel electrophoresis, we talk about running these gels in two dimensions. Um, and in each dimension, we separate on a based on a different property. So in the first dimension, okay, the separation is based on charge. And um, effectively, we can talk about the PI of a protein. So the PI is the isoelectric point. And it's the pH where the net charge on the protein is 0. And so the type of gel we use here is called isoelectric focusing, or IEF. 
Okay, and effectively what's done is that the gel electrophoresis is done through a continuous and stable pH gradient. Okay. And in this gel, the protein will migrate to a position um, where the pH corresponds to the pi. Okay. <coughs> so the anode is low pH and the cathode high pH. So that's quite different than SDS, right? Where in an SDS page gel, we're coating the protein with negative charge. Okay. So then the second dimension is something probably most of us are familiar with, is SDS page. Okay. And so what happens in SDS page, right? We have separation. Based on size here. And molecular weight. So has anyone not run an SDS page gel? And this is totally fine. I never ran one until I was a postdoc, so it's not something to, to be ashamed about if you haven't. Okay, so everyone has. So what's the ratio of SDS molecules to amino acids? So if you take your protein sample and you put it in your you know, loading buffer and run your SDS page. Um, what is the ratio of binding? What is SDS? And what does it do? What happens to your protein in SDS? Okay, what else? So it's a denaturant, right? So it denatures the protein. So why does SDS page let you separate based on molecular weight, more or less? It coats the protein more or less uniformly with negative charge. Yeah. Um, I don't, do we know the exact ratio of binding? I don't. Yeah, so what's the ratio of binding? It can be done in terms of, you know, grams of SDS per grams of protein or number of SDS molecules per amino acid, what is it? I right, and there'll be some know. error, but, but yeah. there's approximates, right? But it's something to think about, right? You're putting your sample into this. Um, so it's about 1.4 grams of SDS per gram of protein. That's the ratio there, right? And as said, the idea is that SDS is giving the protein a large net negative charge. Right, so it's going to override whatever the intrinsic charge is of the protein. Okay, and so it gives all proteins a similar mass to charge ratio here. Um, with that said, sometimes there are proteins that migrate in the gel in a manner that's not reflective of their molecular weight. That's just something to keep an eye out on. So within the slides that will be posted on Stellar, there'll be some background information about both of these methods, the IEF gel and SDS page, um, which I encourage you to take a look there. Okay. So back to the 2D gel. How is this actually going to be run? Okay, so it's one gel. First it needs to run the IEF gel. And you need a special apparatus for this. It's called a cylinder or tube gel. So not flat like what you're all accustomed to for SDS page. Okay, then this gel needs to be equilibrated in the SDS page buffer, 
Okay. And then you run the SDS page separation. And in this step, just to note, the gels rotated 90 degrees. Okay, so what you get you get a gel where we have molecular weight here. We have PI here. And if it's a cell lysate, there's gonna be many, many spots. Okay? Those should all be spots. Unless you did a poor job running the gel. Okay. Okay, so this 2D gel is being used because it's going to provide better separation than a standard 1D gel, right? Imagine trying to separate polypeptides out of some cell lysate um, using just a 1D gel, even after this immunoprecipitation. We'll see that these samples are very complicated here for that. Okay, so what we need is some way to detect the spots that indicate different polypeptides. So what are methods, right? Maybe Kamasi stain for total protein. We can use the radio label, um, so autoradiography, for instance, um, which is what's done here. We're looking at the S35 radio label, or maybe Western blot here. So how are we going to get from this gel to knowing the identity? of each of these spots. You have to ex identify each spot, excise it, um, extract the protein from the gel, digest it, and then run MS and line it up with known protein fragments. Yeah, exactly. Right? So what will be done is that each spot of interest will be cut out of the gel. So you need a way to mark them. You'll see they're numbered in the data that we'll look at. Okay, the protein needs to be extracted out of the gel. Okay, then the protein will be incubated with a protease that will give some number of fragments. Right, trypsin was used in this work. And then that digest can be analyzed by mass spec. And so for each sample, you get all of the M over Z values for the different polypeptides that resulted from the digest. And then effectively, you can compare that to some database um, of E. coli protein sequences. So further details are provided throughout here. Um, so what are the major questions? And um, what are we going to look for answers for in the data here? So first, how many proteins interact with GROEL? Right, we can imagine getting an answer to this by counting the number of spots. Um, what are the identities and structural features and properties of the proteins that interact with GROEL? Right, we're going to get that from, from the mass spec analysis um, and then literature studies. And then another question we can get at is asking how long do proteins interact with GROEL, right? Because recall in the pulse chase, um, samples were taken at various time points over that 10 minute period. So at two minutes, do we see the same polypeptides associated as we see at 10 minutes? Or if we monitor one given polypeptide, um, when does it show up and potentially disappear from the gels? Okay, so all of these samples can be addressed with these methods. And where we'll begin on Friday is going through the data um, in some detail. But just as a prelude to that in the last minute, here's the data from the paper for these gels. Okay, um, so this is looking at the 2D gels for on the top, total soluble cytoplasmic proteins at zero minutes, 
and then total cytoplasmic proteins at 10 minutes. So this is without the immunoprecipitation. And then at the bottom here, what we're looking at are the polypeptides that were isolated from the immunoprecipitation with the anti gro -EL antibody at zero minutes and 10 minutes. And so before we meet next time, what I encourage you to do is take a close look at these gels and see what information um, can you pull out just from a qualitative look, right? So simple questions like we see a lot of proteins here. Um, and please don't go and try and count all the spots. I'll, I'll give you the numbers next time. Um, but, um, you know, how do these gels here from the immunoprecipitation differ from these up top, right? And it's not just the total number of proteins. There's some additional subtleties in these data. Okay, so next time we'll begin examining these data, looking at what polypeptides were pulled down, um, and then we'll move into looking at the chaperone DNAK, DNAKJ system there. Okay.